brother, I think it was Tim, maybe it wasn't. But anyways, uh, if you look at a map of, the, of Israel, the way it was at the time of Christ, there was actually four different, uh, four different sub-territories, all ruled by Rome, but ruled by descendants of Herod the Great. So you had the, the eastern side of the, of the Jordan River, then in the north you had uh, Galilee, in the middle you had Samaria, and then you had Judea down in the south. So the, the king ruling Jerusalem did not have authority in those other three places, okay? So there's four different territories. Uh, in Christ spent most of his time either in Galilee or in Judea, and he's up in, in this town called Capernaum when we start today. That's the north part of Samaria in the land of Galilee. And it was kind of Christ's base of operation. Sometimes the Bible calls it his, his home. He went up from Nazareth to go to Capernaum. Uh, it, apparently, there's a little discrepancy about where Peter's hometown was. But it seems like uh, this is one of Peter's places. And he had a home there. Some people, it, there wasn't a big territory. The whole place of, of Capernaum is now, the land is is uh, owned and administrated by two separate churches. I think maybe, a, 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 well, I'm not sure, maybe one's Catholic, but the other one's definitely Greek Orthodox. And so it's not a big town we're talking about because all the structures, all the archaeology is done on the property of these two churches. And there's not a lot of homes there, but they, some scholars, and there's a little debate about this, but some scholars think that they, they've got uh, a home of, of Peter there. And there was uh, some interesting features to it. There were a lot of uh, utensils that you might not use at home, but you might use in an early uh, in a church. And so they call this uh, Domus Ecclesia, which we would call house church. There you go. So that was, uh, they probably had a house church in the home. Well, I should say possibly had a house church in the very home of, of uh, the Apostle Peter after the time of Christ the church was back together. It's kind of cool to think about in looking at that home actually might make an appearance today. Uh, again, it wasn't a very large town. At its largest, it was probably about 1,500 people, uh, maybe a little more. It was a fishing village. And today, there's the ruins of a synagogue. Uh, we can still see the ruins. And that is the synagogue where people told the people, I am the bread of life. Isn't that cool? You could go and this is where Jesus stood and told people, I'm the bread of life. He didn't give them a philosophy. He didn't give them a religion. He was offering himself. You want life, real life, eternal life? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. A uh, beautiful, beautiful old building. It's kind of neat because uh, it's very Greco Roman. Colors and everything. Not necessarily what you think for a, for a, a Jewish building, but. Uh, we first heard about Capernaum in, in Matthew chapter 4, 12 through 17. Uh, let me read that for you. Now when Jesus heard that John, John the Baptist, had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, so he went north. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah, hundreds of years earlier, Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them light has dawned. From this time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember, when Christ is telling the message of repentance, it's not... Today, how popular is it when, when somebody says, what you're doing is wrong and you need to change? It's not. It was not popular in Christ's time. Don't think because it's, oh, in the Bible days, people love to be told to repent. No. So, brothers and sisters, we discussed this a little bit in Sunday school class. Are we going to be open to the Holy Spirit? Either God is God in our hearts, or, or we try to set up ourselves up as our own gods. Brothers and sisters, we need to work at being good repenters. Repent, because then the kingdom of God grows in our hearts and in our lives. Then in Matthew chapter 8, just last chapter, when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. Remember, a centurion was a 
Roman officer and head of approximately 100 soldiers. And the centurion, this Roman, this Gentile, came to Jesus, imploring him, begging him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. And by the sounds of it, he's not talking about money. I've got one of my slaves. He's a good worker. No, this is a, a friend. This is something he cared about and loved. He's saying, Lord, my servant is paralyzed at home. He's fearfully tormented. Jesus said to him, But the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come underneath my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say this one, go and he goes. And to another, come and he comes. And my slave, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I said to you, I have not found such great faith in anyone in Israel. So it's funny that Isaiah the prophet talks about a light dawning on the Gentiles. Here's a Gentile, the light is dawning on him. I say to you that many, listen, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the kingdom of heaven. The table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people of Israel. Many people from the east and the west who are not Jews. Do we happen to have any people who aren't Jews this morning? Thank God. Thank God that Jesus is saying many people from all over the world are going to come and be able to participate in this blessing that came through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But the sons of the kingdom, not the spiritual sons, but people who, who were connected with Israel but who didn't have faith, the sons of the kingdom will be cast out in utter darkness. Now Jesus, why did Jesus talk about this? The sons of the kingdom will be cast out into utter darkness, and in that place there will be weeping. hellfire is a brimstone message Jesus is giving. Jesus' message from the beginning was repent, repent, repent. And if you don't, there's a place of utter darkness. There's no light. There's no joy there. There's no peace. There's no goodness there. And it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the idea here isn't that you're being tortured. It's the idea of, oh, I keep coming back to Jeffy's words, Kuyashi, which, oh, I, I regret. I should have known better. I should have. It's just this eternal weight of regret for having turned our back on, on the Lord. Now Jesus came to die so that people could go to heaven. And Jesus, God himself knows that people who turn away from God, there's a place of darkness, regret, weeping. If we say we follow Jesus, we have to take seriously what he took seriously. Brothers and sisters, are we taking seriously our friends and our family and the workers who don't know the Lord. Do they have eternity, darkness, sadness before them? Do we believe that Jesus died on the cross and heaven's doors are wide open? Everybody can be forgiven and everybody can be brought into the family if they would repent, turn from themselves and turn to the Lord. Let's love people enough to let them know that God loves them. Jesus died for their sins. I'm tired of, I'm tired and sick of religion that all it does is point fingers at people. Jesus died so heaven could be a more populated place. And Jesus said to the centurion, go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment amazing to think of all the wonderful things that Christ did in this little town. Little town. A lot of miracles. Want to do something sad? No, you don't have choices. Never mind. I'm going to tell you anyways. Christ. Jesus. The good shepherd. The one who carries a little lamb in the picture, you know. Uh, he ends up cursing because of their unbelief. Then he, Jesus, Matthew chapter 11, began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because, why did he denounce them? Because they did not repent. And let's be very careful that the message we're holding out to people is not, you know, you'll smile more if you become a Christian. That, I believe you are humbling yourself to the Lord 
you definitely will find more peace and more joy in your life. But you know, that wasn't the message. I never see that scripture, not even once. We better be careful that the message we're holding out to people is repent. Repent. God is holy. God is holy. There is such a thing as right and wrong, and deep down in your heart, you know you're in rebellion. You know you're in sin. You have to repent. You have to turn the wickedness to the light. And if you do, Jesus will run for grace. He's done everything for you. So Jesus began to denounce the cities. Do you want Jesus to denounce our church? If we're just some human institution and we're full of unbelief, do you want Jesus to denounce curse your family? He began to denounce the cities in which he did the most miracles. And we know God has worked, been working in our church. Why? Because they did not repent. They didn't turn from their own ways to the ways of the living God. And Jesus said, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the miracles for if the miracles that occurred in Tyre and Sidon and Phoenicia, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago. They would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. It means this utter desperation where you're, we're not going to dress up pretty and say, oh, this utter despair, covering themselves with dust and ashes and, and taking off their fine clothes and putting on just these sacks. He said, they would have repented. They would have said, we're sorry for our sins. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable in those Gentile cities of Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted in heaven, will you? You will descend to hell. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, remember Sodom and Gomorrah? If these miracles had occurred in Sodom that have occurred in you, Sodom would still be here to this day. Who is Jesus talking to? A bunch of atheists. No. Who is Jesus talking to? Religious people. Just because we talk, talk, go to church. These people were religious. They were probably tithing. They were, they were going to synagogue. They probably knew a lot of scripture. They didn't have faith. They had knowledge. They didn't have faith. They didn't follow Jesus. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Don't you think, oh, Sodom's a big, nasty city. We're in an idyllic little uh, country fishing village. Not the, not ticked off at those people. They don't have any overt sin like Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you believe what Jesus said or not? Didn't the part of you not want to believe what Jesus just said? We spend, we spend in American Christianity, well, I keep saying American Christianity, modern Christianity across the globe, we spend a lot of time creating Jesus in our own image, and we try to paint over these things. We don't want Jesus to say, say what he really says. Did everybody follow that? village is in trouble because they're religious. They're not following God. Beware, beware of empty religion. Remember when Christ talked about the wide road that leads to destruction? We said the little path is less traveled if you get a better view. That the people he was talking to, not a bunch of atheists, not a bunch of pagans, not a bunch of people who were practicing some strange cult. He was talking to people who were trying to follow the Old Testament. He was talking to people who were follow, trying to follow what God had revealed to them. Brothers and sisters, this is dangerous. 
because they come to him and they and they don't say well how was i supposed to know they said lord we did all these miracles in your name he says go away from that. Don't know. is it possible that there are churches today even this morning there's a cross on the steeple they open up their bibles maybe sing the same songs that we sang Outward religious, without a repentant heart inside. Is it possible? Is it possible that our church be one of those? We, we don't humble ourselves and keep ourselves open to the Holy Spirit and His correction. Is it possible that week after week, month after month, even years, somebody could sit in here and be very comfortable? Part of me would like to say it's not possible because, because we go after that stuff. But, but is it? Be religious, do the religious thing. And yet, when's the last time that a sin broke us? It's the last time we're truly thankful for the cross. It's the last time the passion of Christ for the lost gripped our souls. When, when's the last time our minds reflected the mind of Christ? Burnham. Part of me would like to have a whole bunch of those religious folks, like in, in Capernaum, fill up the seats. But before we get too harsh, some did have it. God is pleased with them. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, 1 through 8. You remember that story? Uh, where Jesus is, is teaching and a bunch of guys are, are carrying their buddy on a stretcher. And remember, they couldn't get to Jesus because there's so many crowds. Did anybody remember that story? Yeah? And so what did the buddies do? Do you remember? What'd they do? They went through the roof. They tore open the roof. It lowered him down in the middle of the crowd so that Jesus could heal him. And that was very possibly uh, Peter's home. So you wonder if Peter's there and uh, Jesus, are you going to rebuke them for destroying my roof? And Jesus doesn't even mention it. In fact, he applauds them. So, I don't know. You can get out of that what you need to get out of that. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, 1 through 8. Uh, Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his, uh, his uh, own town. His Capernaum. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, or, or the literal translation would be, uh, give good cheer, little one, little child. Your sins are forgiven. So we know from the book of Mark what happens here. These buddies lower their friend down in the middle of the crowd, and uh, Jesus sees this paralyzed guy, and he said uh, he saw their, the faith of their friend. Wow, look at the, the lengths these fellows did to bring their friend here. And he says, uh, take heart, be encouraged, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Are we following just an empty religion full of rules and regulations? If so, if our honest about our sin, all we are is condemned before God. Brothers and sisters, do you believe in God that died, paid the penalty, died for your sin? When Jesus is saying, take heart, what he's really saying is, take heart, your sins are forgiven because I'm going to take care of that. It's before the cross. Jesus looks at this one. He wants to encourage him. He's a little one. Jesus is not, a, not an old man. He was a young man. But everybody's his child. Take heart, young one. I've got your back. I've got this covered. I'm going to take responsibility for your sin. At this, some of the teachers of law said to themselves, this fellow is blasphemy. And I see where they're coming from. Because if I saw some preacher 
if I saw some some politician or some teacher and, and he came up to this person and said your sin is forgiven I think, whoa 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 you can't do that he didn't he only God can forgive sin only God can forgive sin because it's God's moral law it's God's character that we transgress that we we go across the line of God's will and so only God can forgive now Jesus didn't have a problem with that because he knew who he was but these fellas think no this this guy this fellow this person he's blaspheming now look at Jesus' response though Jesus knowing their thoughts Jesus said why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? And I looked up the word evil and it means evil. Uh, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? And so, and I got thinking about that. Well, if they were, if they, in their heart, they didn't, they honestly didn't know who Jesus was. And if they, in their heart, says, wait a second, only God can, a man shouldn't be able to do this. I don't think he would have said they were evil thoughts. I think he would have, he would have looked at them and said, you know what, guys, watch this so that you will know that I can forgive sins. But instead, he said, you have evil thoughts, and it's very likely they were offended because they were teachers of the law. In that little community, they were big deals. And here Jesus is, this huge crowd around him, he's forgiving sins. They weren't offended, they weren't upset for the glory of God, they were upset for their own glory. It's my suspicion on that. The Bible doesn't go into detail, but just thinking he shouldn't be able to forgive sins before they knew he was God. I don't think that's what Christ uh, was addressing here. Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Well, which is easier for God? Well, everything's easy for God. If you're God, you can say you're healed, and if you're God, you can say your sins are forgiven. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, so he said, I want you to know. In other words, this miracle is a sign. This miracle is so that we will know who Christ is and that he has authority to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. doesn't say he took his mat, but I'm assuming. Then the crowd saw this, and they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to human beings. Go back to uh, verse, verse 1 and 2 there, or verse 2. Some men brought him, a paralyzed man, lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Uh, I think there's a lot of work. make a hole in the roof, lower him down. It was audacious, that's for sure. Bold move, big plans. Do you have any friends that don't want to do this? Why did this man get saved? Because he faith in his friends. Friends believed, do you see that? The friends believed enough to bring their buddy to Jesus. And so heaven became more populated because of their faith. Do you have co-workers? Do you have family? Do you have neighbors? Hobby buddies. Bowling teammates. Whatever. Do you know somebody that you have to pretty much pick them up and bring them to Jesus? I'm not saying kidnap per se. Scrub that from the video just in case, you know. What I'm talking about, though, is this aggressive, this desire. We are going to bring our friend to Jesus. And nothing, not even somebody's roof is going to stand in the way. Isn't that a beautiful faith for their friend? Jesus saw their faith. He said to this man, your sins are forgiven. Let us live our lives that, so that they count. We don't want our friends and family to go into eternity of weeping and gnashing of teeth and regret, eternal darkness. Go ahead and grab everybody you know. Bring them to Jesus. There's nothing we could do. 
for them. The rest of their lives, these men, they're mentioned in Scripture right here because nothing else in their lives was important is what they did right then, right there when they brought their friend to Jesus. What about buying a house? Not as important as this. What about getting their own fishing boat? Not as important as this. Nothing as important as bringing people to, to Jesus. So that their destiny, their eternal destiny, could go from darkness to light. The power of salvation. As a church, as individuals, what price is too high? They have dug through their own roof. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure they did that. But I'm, I'm being uh, comical to make a point. Let us be people, when we have a Savior, who went the extra effort, the extra mile, to actually end up on a Roman cross, hammered to a Roman cross, so that I can go to heaven. Maybe I need to get out of my car. Maybe I have to drive 10 minutes out of my way, half hour of my way, to grab some Maybe I need to pay for lunch afterwards and say, let's talk about what we heard at church. Find some strength, my child. Your sins are forgiven. You know what? These words are sweet to somebody who knows the weight of their sin. These words are sweet. This is living water. This is life. Somebody says, I've tried to be a good person, and I see the way I've stumbled again and again. Do you know you're a sinner? Let Jesus forgive you. God, the one who is going to die on that cross says, be encouraged. I've got your back. I'm going to catch you when you fall. We've got a good God. We've got a God lightning bolts just eager to just zap us. We've got a God who said, I will lay down my life. black, nasty. I've seen every time you said vile things and thought vile things. I've seen it all. I want you in my family. You know, maybe this man on the stretcher didn't have any great theological depth. Maybe his friends didn't really completely understand, but they believe. They believed enough to come to Jesus. And sometimes, sometimes when we don't know all the answers, it's okay to say, yeah, I don't know. But let's go get close to Jesus and see what happens. We've been trying this other way. We've been breaking our, our we've been breaking ourselves in life trying to live our other way. Let's just get close to Jesus and see what happens. As a result, something big, bigger than a physical healing happened. Forgiveness of sins, eternal life, blessing of God. Sisters, ladies of God, the choices you make, the way you decide to live your life,
brothers, you know, guys, we want to do something big. We want to do something important with our lives. We want to make our mark. Brothers, make your mark in eternity. Go out there. Carry another brother. Use your strength. Endure hardship. Bust through a wall. Men, go do it. Bring people to Jesus before it's too late. Before it's too late. Our faith can result in more celebration in paradise. Take heart, brother. Take heart, sister. You've come to Jesus Christ in faith. Don't live a broken, defeated life. Don't live a life continually broken and upset, and bruised and battered because of our sins. Jesus, be encouraged. Because I forgive you, and that's what counts. That's what matters. You know, sometimes the world can beat us up, and we feel so miserable. And when you're down and depressed, taking another breath can seem like too much work. Going up a flight of stairs can seem like too much. And, and you look at your prospects, and they don't look good. Maybe financially, maybe relationally, maybe health. Sometimes we fail so badly, we don't only let down God, we let down ourselves, and our standards are actually quite a bit lower than His. We tend to give ourselves a pass on a lot of things, and sometimes we even let ourselves down. And that hurts. I mean, I know I'm not measuring up to God's standards, but when I don't even measure up to my own. And then we've got this fellow. You know God's real? You know angels are real? There's an angel who rebelled against God. His name is Lucifer, say the devil. He's a liar. And the Bible says he is the accuser of the saints. The devil wants to get in your face again and again and again and accuse you of your sin. And he's going to lie to you and tell you the cross of Christ? Forget about that. You are messed up before holy God. He's going to try, you, try to get you so upset and so depressed and despondent that you can hardly show your face in church anymore. You don't want to read your Bible or pray because you feel like a hypocrite. Newsflash! We are not holy enough to receive this. We are not good enough to talk with God. That's what grace is for. So don't listen to the devil. The devil does not, this is, we're not going to get into demonology this morning, but here's a little clue. The devil does not have your best interests at heart. He's going to lie to you. Don't believe what he has to say. Don't buy what the devil's selling. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you got down on your knees? Have you, have you, have you said, Lord, I stop I'm a sinner forgive me I want to follow your ways if so if so there's one thing I want you to take home today just this one phrase from Jesus Christ take heart your sin is forgiven all of it because the blood of Christ is greater than all of our sins combined take heart be encouraged be forgiven <coughs> yesterday I was out uh, walking with my son Aaron and uh, he was uh, riding his little bike that we got for his birthday. Aaron, did your dad say we ran into him at Toys R Us? He saw us buying the bike. That was kind of cool. And uh, got a little bike for Aaron. And he was, uh, well, it was more than I wanted to pay, but it's been a good exercise program for me. So it's kind of worth it. And I get to walk uh, with Aaron and uh, say, hey, buddy, you want to go ride for your bike? Been doing that almost every day, sometimes a couple times a day. And uh, he gets his helmet on. And we came to a driveway because we wanted to go across the street, and it was a little slanted there. And uh, I walked down to the bottom, and I knew he was going to be a little concerned. I turned around, and I watched him. He's thinking seriously, he's trying to work his pedals. He's, he's got these cheeks, you know. And he's got a real serious, intense look on his face. And uh, I'm looking there, and I'm, I'm waiting watched him for a bit. He looks cool in my helmet, by the way. And a little red bike. 
And I said, uh, I just said it. I wouldn't pay you anything too deep. I said, come on, I'll catch you. All the pressure went out of his face. He pushed that wheel down. He went down the driveway, and I caught him, which we've done before. But immediately, this smile erased all the worry. He came down the driveway, and, and of course, Dad caught him. And I was just blessed in that moment. Because just telling my son, it's okay. I'm going to be here to catch you. Just was able to take so much of a concern out of the situation for him. So blessed how natural and easy it was for him to trust me to do this. I think about my heavenly Father. About these words of Jesus right here: "Take heart, your sins are forgiven." When I'm scared, when I'm worried, when I'm upset, when I feel I don't measure up to the task, which is like most of the time. Uh, when I'm disappointed, maybe in the world, maybe in myself, whatever. God, my daddy in heaven, saying, it's okay. I'm here. I'm here. Be encouraged, take heart, it's okay. When Christ died for my sin and rose again, in effect, he was saying, I got it. I got it. I don't think I can stand on the way to my sin. I got it. I got it. Those sins you're fretting over, I, I'm paying for those. I paid for them on the cross. So let's get going. Uh, we, have, uh, we have things we need to do together. We have places we need to go together. And if you're just sitting around underneath the weight of all that, we're not going anywhere. I got it. Be brave. If you stumble... I will catch you. That's what my blood is for. That's what grace is for. Brothers, sisters, have you ever experienced peace, joy, comfort, knowing? That's a gift. This is this kind of cool. Think about it. This is a gift. The knowledge that I'm a sinner. Forgiven completely and embraced by the love of God. That's a, that's a joy that angels in heaven will never experience. Now they have the joy of standing before God in holiness, serving God in holiness. I look forward to that day myself. But they will never have the joy of knowing that Jesus loved me enough to die for me. He accepts me completely. He's not going to send me away. He's not going to divorce his children. We need to spend more time celebrating this kind of grace. Amen for that. We need to celebrate grace. When's the last time that you actually took a pause, pushed the pause button on all the heaviness of life and say, wait a second. I'm forgiven. I am forgiven. All I messed up. I'm forgiven, and I'm not going to listen to the devil. Don't like the direction my life went these last couple weeks. I am forgiven because the blood of Christ forgave all of my sin. If not, I do have a warning. If you've never taken joy out of the knowledge of your sins forgiven, maybe it's if you've never taken your sins seriously enough before. You don't understand, really, that sin separates us from holy God. We need to repent. Turn away from ourselves and turn to God. said, come to me, everybody who's weary, everybody who's heavy laden, says, and I will give you rest. We need to come in genuine faith, we need to take heart, understand that our sins are forgiven, and that's far greater than the blessings Brothers and sisters, a couple things. A, let's be that good friend who goes out and grabs somebody and brings them close to Jesus. And B, let's live our lives in peace and joy and thanksgiving and the thankfulness of knowing that Jesus has our back, he's got us covered. When we stumble, when we sin, 
you know what? That's what grace is for. Take heart. You've got a God who went to the cross for us. You know He's not going to drop you. Live for Jesus every day, every minute of our lives. Let's glorify Him in our lives. Foundation Bible Church. Inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.